Uh, I was called back to the CIA after I uh, retired and um, spent several years in recruitment. We were going out recruiting people to come into the CIA, and you're exactly right. We looked for people that had a sense of citizenship, who uh, had some kick to them. I mean, they, um, they, they, we were looking for people with personality. We didn't want completely vanilla, completely dumbed down uh, people. We were looking for people with some kick, but also who had values for it duty, honor, and country. So during the time in college, uh, the time I remember, it was very chaos in uh, the campus. Uh, did you ever go into protest, the war, or anything like that, or you a hawk? Well, before uh, joining the Army, there wasn't any protest. I was uh, went to college in 61, 62, uh, and 63, dropped out and joined the Army. When I came back, I got married, and she's the one I insisted go. My wife insisted I go back to college. That's when there was a lot of uh, anti-war, which always struck me as funny. Uh, and another great thing about coming back and going to college, we didn't have any money. She made a hundred dollars a week as a secretary. I made a hundred and twenty-five dollars a month on the GI Bill, but we paid our bills. We paid a mortgage on a trailer. We paid our tuition. We set aside money for for Christmas. And then we, we, we palled up with other GIs that were back from Vietnam. We would have bring your own steak dinners. They had to bring their own meat to come to our house to eat supper. Uh, but nobody had any money, so it was okay. So we were, it was us against all those crazy, pimply-faced, anti-war people. And they, they pretended to have moral objections to the war. They didn't know from nothing. Uh, at a time when, when I remember just being chasing after girls all the time, these guys having this been driven by moral indignation, it was, it was just popular. It was just a popular craze that was going on. Well, they said and they, they just they didn't know about the war. We were back from fighting uh, there in the year and they just didn't. People say that the Vietnam War torn American society in pieces. Uh, how, can you make a comment on that? Well, it's, it's what people talked about, and they took positions. Um, and they took positions much like abortion, I imagine, and, and, and capital punishment now. You either were for the war or you were against the war. And you had those years of the U.S. media saying it was a bad war. So the number of people who were for the war became smaller and small, smaller, and the people who were against the war became more and more. Um, and we didn't have any clear champions. We didn't have anybody speaking for the good war. We had John Wayne in the Green Berets uh, early on with Kennedy. And Kennedy sort of supported the war, so it was okay. But in a democracy that we have in the United States, you have to fight with the uh, approval of the citizenry. So for whatever reasons, the citizens were behind it, uh, then it was probably right to get out. So uh, you have a friend who joined army and fought in Vietnam. Any one of them or in your family that killed or bad injury from the war? No, but I had many friends uh, and men in my platoon. I think there was only one man in my platoon from Vietnam that lasted the year without getting wounded. When I went to Vietnam, there were four good buddies, myself, Larry Peterson, Bob Dunn, and George McCoy. George was killed in Vietnam. Dunn was wounded twice. Peterson was wounded, he had, his shoulder now looks like a coat hanger. He was wounded uh, uh, and was evacuated, uh, and I was wounded once. And so I knew a lot of people who were, who, were, uh, who were killed in Vietnam. So you and your friend, either you got drafted or you volunteered, you all uh, came to Vietnam to fight in the Senate, you fight for your country, was it? How was it? Well, um, in 1965, uh, Lyndon Johnson said that he was sending in uh, the first Cav to go into the Highlands because he had information that the North Vietnamese wanted to drive across the Highland and, and divide South Vietnam. And then he was going to send the first division in, my division, uh, northwest of Saigon to act sort of as a buffer to keep the North Vietnamese away from Saigon. 
So, but he didn't say it was for combat, it was for police in action, and we were not sure exactly what that meant. But we thought we were there to keep the peace and to act as a deterrent uh, for North Vietnamese coming in. We did not think we were going for combat. But on the boat trip over, we heard about uh, Colonel Moore in the Adrang Valley. He was fighting uh, the North Vietnamese Colonel Ann. Um, and he really got his, um, uh, he, he really uh, had, he got his shirt ripped. It was really a bad battle. So we realized on the ship over that we were going to be involved in, uh, in combat. Uh, so, so you were not one of the, among the Marines, you know, but you ship before that, before the Marines came? No, the Marines were there. There was a detachment of Marines uh, at, um, Tay Ninh, I think. Uh, uh, Did that in the name? Yeah. And uh, we, we got there at the end of August, 1st of September, 1965. Yes. So some Marines were there, the 173rd was there, the first camp was there, and then we came in. But there were, you know, a lot of advisors before uh, we got there. I was not the first person to South Vietnam, but I was among the first. Well, you uh, in CIA later on, but I need to ask questions about the coup d'etat that you President well, did, But I, I, I wasn't there uh, when there. that happened, and okay. I don't know about the CIA involvement in that. Um, sometime I, I am writing another book about uh, battle in Laos, so I'm following the history of, uh, of, of Laos. Um, and so to expand on this thing about Dim. Um, in 54, when uh, the, the Viet Minh uh, beat the French at Dinh Dinh Phu, and the Vietnam was, was uh, divided at the 17th parallel, uh, Laos was supposed to be neutral. Right. Uh, North Vietnam was supposed to take its troops out of Laos, uh, and there was not supposed to be any foreign military there. The French had to leave, uh, so the French left. And what was left was a country in name only because it had this diverse population, the Hmong, the Hill tribe, the, the, uh, the Mayo, and then the lowland Lao, and they didn't have much in common. They didn't like each other. Uh, the Hmong were illiterate. Uh, they didn't have a written language. And then you had the mountain people and the lowland people. So it, it, was, it, was, not a, it was not a country uh, very much together. But North Vietnam, the Viet Minh, wanted Laos, and now the French are gone. Uh, and the Laos were not very good soldiers. Uh, the Hills Tribe people were very defiant. They were isolated people. They were not easily approached. But the lowland people around the Mekong had been trained by the French, but they just did not make good soldiers. At the first round, at the first sound of battle, uh, they would take off and run. So North Vietnamese uh, used, there were three princes, uh, and they used one to front for the pro communist uh, party in Laos, and they wanted to take in Laos. What was the United States and Thailand to do? Were we to allow the Vietnamese come and, and just appropriate it? Uh, wasn't it in the free world's interest for us to do something to counter the, the Vietnamese move in? So uh, how do you do that? Well, you look for the, the Lao people that most support your position, and you support them. Uh, and, and that's what we did. We went and we got in contact with Vang Pao, with the Hmong in the mountains, and with uh, General Pumi uh, in the south. Well, Pumi didn't turn out very well. He had a coup and then there was a counter coup and he was finally left. But the CIA went with the best of intention to try and get some counter force to, to, the, to the Vietnamese. They wanted, the United States wanted to preserve South Vietnam. Now, and, and everybody I knew in the CIA uh, had the same moral compass. There were no brutal people I ever met in the CIA. Uh, the people who were managers were uh, Americans, they were conscientious Americans. There, there were no crazy people in the CIA. They wanted to preserve South Vietnam. Sometimes, like in Laos, when we supported Vang Pao, which worked out, supported Pumi, didn't work out. Um, they did things in support of what they hoped would be in the long term best interest. And with them, I don't know if that worked out or not. And I don't know if the CIA was, and don't, 
I don't know what the CIA did. I don't have any okay, any first-hand yes, knowledge. Yes. Okay, so uh, you uh, talk about the name Bang Pao, uh, since you know him very well. Yes. I want to ask a question. He died not long ago. Yes. And before that, he was kept in a prison because he was, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, accused for whatever. What do you think about that? Uh, I, I don't know. That was. It was not. I don't know. It was somebody who was, who, who didn't, who, who weren't aware of his background. He was a great man. Um, I, I worked with General Vang Pao for two years. Uh, we held the North Vietnamese off. The CIA went in and we supported General Vang Pao and we didn't use the military. We used the Air Force. Uh, we used his forces and we used Thai forces. Uh, but we were successful because of General Vang Pao. The Americans coming in to help the South Vietnamese, uh, with rare exception, would come in for one year and leave, uh, another year and leave. The, the men that were the most helped to South Vietnam stayed for year after year after year. That's what the CIA did with Vang Pao. People would go to work for Vang Pao and they would stay for years. Hogg was there for eight years. Burr was there uh, seven or eight years. Shep, TJ. People would go to Laos. I would, I would have stayed in Laos forever. I had such respect for that man. And it transcended culture. It transcended... Uh, he wasn't educated. Um, but he was, he was a patriot for his homeland. Um, he hated the North Vietnamese uh, because they were aggressive and they were coming into his homeland and he was willing to die. And he passed that on to his people. And so, something I found, Nancy, in, in my associate, not in Africa, around the world, I mean, I, uh, I, it was not only in Laos and Vietnam, but that leaders can make the difference. Um, that uh, like the lowland Lao were not very good soldiers unless they had good leaders. If they had good leaders, then they could fight with the enemy and did in fact fight with the with the North Vietnamese. But if you had a if you had a group of people, Vang Pao would always be the center. Even when they was brought to the United States on a tour, people invariably would talk to him. Have you ever noticed that a group and when you would have a group, there's one person people tend to talk to. You know, they'll address their comments to him. He doesn't necessarily have to be the one who's talking the most, but he's sort of the alpha animal. We have that about us. We, we, want, we want leadership, and Vang Pao had that. He was an alpha animal, and he lived there, and he was fighting for his country then. And we, the CIA, we supported him. We respected him, and we supported him, and we loved him. Uh, so, um, in... Uh American uh, history textbook, they wrote American invaded Vietnam and then um, I asked, I interviewed a lot of people um, already and I asked them did American invaded <coughs> Vietnam and they said North Vietnam invaded South Vietnam and American come to help. What, what is your perspective about this? Who invade who? Um. Can I give a long answer? Yes. Um, the Second World War uh, changed everything in Indochina. Before the Second World War, before 1940, the French had a pretty uh, good old colonialism w was firm. I mean, it, and there wasn't there was some rebellion, but it was firm. Uh, Second World War, uh, it was the Vichy French that were running uh, that was running Indochina, and they were not so strong. So the whole of the French on Indochina. Uh, became very weak and there were these nationalistic uh, factions that developed in, in Laos um, it developed the sense of well, we want our own freedom we don't want to work for uh, the French anymore and in uh, the northern part of Vietnam it was Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh, had, you know, he had studied and he had traveled to the United States. He had studied in France. He had been to China. He knew uh, Marxism uh, and he had these ideas about nationalism. Well, the, the people that he talked to supported him. Uh, the, the, there was difference in, the, in the, the, the people in northern Vietnam were a little tougher, I think, than in South Vietnam. The South Vietnam were not as confrontational. The South, these people in southern Vietnam were a little more relaxed, but it was just the nature of the region. I, I think even people in North Vietnam 
would laugh about the people in South Vietnam being a little slow or being a little lazy or, uh, or, or whatever. But when, when Ho Chi Minh was, was, was striking for independence with the Viet Minh, for him it was all of Vietnam that was, had been controlled by the French before. He was, at, he was fighting to free all of Vietnam. Uh, and then um, in 1953 he invaded Laos. And uh, some forces got almost down to Long Prabang. And for the next year, they had a new French commander in. He said, well, they're not going to get into Laos next time. And that's when he started that, at Dinh Vinh Phu, he started that, uh, that hedgehog uh, defense. And, and then Ho Chi Minh realized he had him. He had him for two reasons. One, Dinh Vinh Phu was not a very good place to, because it was down in the valley and, and the North Vietnamese uh, were in the thing. And then you had the Geneva Conference coming up. Ho Chi Minh realized the potential. If you really wax the French in Dinh Vinh Phu, we got the Geneva uh, Conference, plus the ability to make a government and a defense. So Ho Chi Minh felt like he had been boxed in by the Chinese and the, the Russians at the Geneva Accord of 54. And he was not going to be taken in by any more negotiations. So in 54, you had that, uh, there were people from, they had a choice. You want to go to South Vietnam, go to South Vietnam. And a lot of the Catholics and a lot of the other people went down because it was not as uh, harsh in South Vietnam. Um, but the majority of the people in South Vietnam, even in 1954, were dark-skinned Buddhists. When the government running, I mean, it was Bo Diem to begin with, you know, the, the king, and then Diem took over. But they were light-skinned Catholics. So the majority of the people in South Vietnam, dark-skinned Buddhists, people that were running them were light-skinned uh, Catholic. And the only way they knew about running the government is what they had learned from the French. They didn't involve the people. The people didn't have buy-in. Whereas Ho Chi Minh had that political apparatus that went all the way down, you know, in each one of his units, he would have the political officer, then he'd have the military officer. And he also had it out there in the citizenry. The citizenry in North Vietnam believed in Ho, and they believed they were fighting for their homeland and their naturalism. In South Vietnam, they did not have that same attention to politics. In fact, the politics of South Vietnam was not, it disenfranchised the people in the countryside. Whereas a good government would have said, okay, we're not even, get out of Saigon. Get out there with the people. Learn what's going on with the people. And corruption, you're gonna be shot. If there's any corruption, you're gonna be shot. Corruption was allowed to exist, and there was a, there was not a bond established with the people. So in 56, there were not elections. Um, and you can understand uh, Ho, but, but see, that is the book I'm writing now, because he had to invade Laos to come down. There's only 54 miles. At the 17th parallel, it's only 54 miles across. He cannot attack South Vietnam. He's got to come into Laos. Uh, so he did come into Laos uh, and, and come down. But another thing, too, is the United States in 1954, Nancy, um, and Brenda and I were, were growing up then, Russia had their missiles aimed at, at and we would have, uh, we would have uh, high, duck and hide drills in school if we were bombed. I lived next to this big military base, and we realized if the Soviet Union decided to bomb us, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be hit. We were at, it was a cold war going on. We were afraid of communist countries. If a country was communist, they were bad. There was no sort of good communist. And Ho Chi Minh was, was labeled as communist, but he was not a communist in as much as he was a nationalist. He wanted for Vietnam, he, and he, he wanted a Vietnam. If we had approached him and said, okay, we understand, you want a Vietnam, stop your, your commerce with China, and they would have. North Vietnam doesn't like China, uh, and, um, and we'll deal with you that way. Uh, we might have talked him out of it, but I think he was intent uh, on it, uh, on taking South Vietnam. The way you express, you seem like you believe that Ho Chi Minh is a nationalist. But how can you be a nationalist when you a member of international communists? Because the communism, the theory is they will conquer 
the whole war and then the whole war right. have hegemony. No, right. Yeah, or have no government but one. Uh, so. But that's why I don't think Ho Chi Minh signed into that. He wasn't part of the of the uh, international communism. He was a nationalist. If somebody had come to Ho Chi Minh and said, well, we're going to take some of your money and use it in communist battles in Africa, you'd say no. Uh, so when you talk like that, uh, we also interviewed Bo Tin. He was a colonel of uh, uh, North Vietnamese. Um, and then he, the one that, a high-ranking officer of North Vietnam, uh, came to uh, um, President Palace on uh, April 1975. Uh -huh. He said that, um, Ho Chi Minh lied to Vietnamese people because he said that well go and uh, come under me uh, united together. So when we uh, first uh, we fight to, to gain independence from France, and now we fight to gain independence from American. So that's why people fight hard. And then he said that he said so, but his ultimate goal is for, for communists for a society. I, I disagree. My opinion about Ho Chi Minh, and I'm no authority, but my opinion is that he was a, a nationalist. Chinese and the Soviets were exporting communism uh, initially to North Vietnam, but also to Africa, to India, to the United States, to South America, and he wasn't part of that. So he went to France and he would want Before he's a young man. Yeah, yeah he's, he's a, a cook. young man. And he was a cook, but later he was in France. He joined the, the joined, communist groups. Yeah, communist group, and he was one of the big force. And he, his duty, he go to Indochina and then make all the country into communist. Will, well, but he did, and then he went to the United States. But he came back to North, and he went to China. They put him in jail because he was talking about in in China about his brand of nationalism, and they put him in jail. And they held him in jail in China until he agreed that uh, he would take Chinese aid uh, and he would fight it. I, I, I think if you're, Ho Chi Minh is hard, is, is hard uh, to accuse of things like Pol Pot or Mao Zedong. Uh, they were brutal people. Uh, they would kill uh, in a minute. Uh, I think the real demon was Gep uh, in, in the north who would kill a million people uh, if he had to on, on Ho's uh, orders. You mean Zap? G-I-A-P? Yeah. Gap. Gap. Zap. He the one who uh, um, command the Dien Bien Phu yes. uh, battle. Yes. Later now, they, uh, the Chinese uh, reviewed that. They were, uh, Chinese were the architect for that war. And then they also sent so many not just advisor, but troops there to help, and then I don't, I don't think so, Nancy. I, 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 in Dindinville? Yes, Dindinville. They, 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 they helped with logistics, and they sent all the artillery, but it was what, 500 miles from the Chinese border. I don't, I don't see anything about China. You know, there was a Russian photographer there at the very end taking, taking pictures. But, but Nancy, I don't, I'm, I don't mean to be saying anything that doesn't strongly support South Vietnam. Uh, because I believed in South Vietnam, I believe the people there should have freedom because they understood democracy and that's what they wanted. And it was the people out in the countryside. I, I see the failing there is that they, they didn't have a, a, they wanted democracy, they wanted to be free, they understood the concept of being free. They didn't want communism to tell them what to do. And I supported their fight to stay free. But they didn't, they weren't bonded with the government in Saigon uh, in, in that endeavor. Uh, and there was corruption there and there's poor leadership there. Well, well if I ask you a question, I just want to dig in to find out the truth, so don't take it personal. Uh, that um, if Ho Chi Minh is a nationalist, why when he won the war, he had the North, and he didn't find a way to make peace with the South, but rather, he roused up with a bunch of international communists to attack the South. So that's my question. Well, when did he die? 69. 69. So that was right after Tet. Yeah. And I think in his last year, or last year and a half, he wasn't effective. Uh, I think he, he started the movement going, and then it was people like Gap. I say Gap, you say what? Zap. Zap. Mm -hmm. I think Zap ideology had taken over. 
So that sense of 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 uh, nationalism uh, began to disappear in about '67 or I so. I think the communist uh, communist party. They yeah, the communist party was they, they, was kicking in. Yeah. I, I think the communist, and you may have a point there. Then it became more of a communist endeavor yeah. when he began to fade away in about '67, dying in '69. And, and, and Gap was all for that. And Gap was responsible for a million people dying uh, in, in Tep and all of the battles that, that he had, sending hundreds and hundreds and hundreds to a certain death uh, yeah, attacking well, those positions. Yes. For now, uh, well, some be, uh, there's some effort to try to honor Ho Chi Minh as a uh, greatest, one of the greatest uh, hero uh, for me and Kai, uh, what do you think about it? Uh, UNESCO will uh, recognize that. What do you think about that? Do you support that idea? Well, just like uh, uh, Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. I don't support all these the celebration about him. I think we were there was a cultural evolution here, and his name is. But I don't I don't think he is responsible for it. I think after the Second World War, around the world things were changing. I think there was a cultural revolution. I think colonialism was dead. And the French were the last vestige there, and Ho Chi Minh is sort of attached to that. When the, it, 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 there were other bigger, it was almost like fate, this enormous momentum going to get rid of colonialism. Yeah, uh, we sitting here and talk about a little different view about Ho Chi Minh, but I know that the many nationalist party of Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, who have a big deal about it because Ho Chi Minh he would call for a United uh, Front called Viet Minh, so they all round up all the uh, nationalist um, party came in under him, and then he killed one by one. And uh, you know, after he won uh, during the time that they were fight with France, they, he also anybody didn't uh, join him, didn't uh, they kill? Uh, they, they kill and they kill right. hundreds of people that fought with him day by day, uh, side by side. Mm. So uh, it's it hard to, to conclude here, I understand. And do you have any more things? But, 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 but Nancy, back question? in that time, that's almost the way they did business. Yeah. Uh, in Indochina, I mean, you had, it was sort of the mindset. I mean, we are here in America. What a great place this is. We don't worry about our safety. Um, death is, uh, by, uh, by criminals, is almost, it's not, it's not done. In, in that part of the world, in that period, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, how many people were killed in China? Millions and millions of people. And in Cambodia, how many people were killed? Millions. And, and killing somebody to eliminate them was almost accepted. Uh, they lived by different rules then, in that place then. What you want to do, that you have that freedom, uh, we know that and we know how how precious it is uh, and how it's worth fighting for. Um, but in here we're talking about things that I'm not a pro on. I, I am a pro on fighting in, I, I mean, I have information. I can speak with authority on fighting against uh, the, the Viet Cong 65-66 uh, in Kuchi, uh, coming into that area. And that's where I was wounded. A little guy jumped out of a hole and shot me in one side of the butt and outside the, the other. That's how you were with CIA or are you still a no, combat? That, that, that was with the army. Oh, uh, it. it was a big explosion on the trail and I was out trying this guy who was dying and I was trying to help him and a little Viet Cong jumped out of a hole and it was no bigger than that shoe uh, in so, shot me. <laughs> let me ask you a question like this. Uh, well, you, you went in there, uh, came into Vietnam and then we all look alike, are we? Uh, so how do you know which one are communist, which one not? And if they're, shooting, how, how if they're shooting at me, they're communist. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and that's already too late, isn't uh, it? <laughs> you know, Nancy, there's something else too about uh, my attitude and Brenda's attitude uh, towards Asia and, uh, and people from Asia. I mean, our children uh, are Asian. Um, and we don't... We don't, um, Joe was talking one time, we lived in Georgia, and he, could, he said he could tell when people had never seen uh, an Asian person before, because they were a little uncomfortable or they didn't make eye contact or whatever. Um, but I lived for two years with a Hmong up in the mountains of Laos, 
Uh, Brenda lived for years uh, in Taiwan and uh, in Thailand, and we are we 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 are comfortable. We we understand uh, the the, Asian, the way they think uh, and their uh, their values. Mm, so uh, about looking like I don't know I you know I I but. But I'm CIA too, and around the world there are good people, and there are funny people, and there are smart people, and there are dumb people. I found that smart people, educated people, there's, it's easy to establish you know, a relationship, to get along, if they're educated and they're smart. If they're not smart, boy, you got some problems, and you almost can't reason. I was two years in Afghanistan. They say, and I was on the, in the west of Afghanistan, and they said the literacy rate is 20%, 80% of the people are illiterate. Well, that may be around Kabul, but not out where I worked. Only one man in 20 could write his name. They were not, they were not educated, and they were not very smart. Even if you were to expose them to education, they wouldn't absorb it, they couldn't handle it. Uh, and you can't deal with people like that. If they're not intelligent enough to understand some of the concepts about arching cultures and getting along, you know, what chance do you have of finding a, a mutual solution? But with the Asians, every place we went, we, we, we loved the Thais. I, I love the Hmong. I love the Vietnamese uh, that, I, that I met there. Uh, so uh, when and why you joined CIA? She was working. I was just going to kill some time before I picked her up from work at college. I was back getting my degree and stopped by the employment office at the university. And there was a CIA guy there and I said, what are you doing? And he said he was CIA. And I said, oh, mm, mm. <laughs> So we went in and talked and six months later I came on board. I see. What is that different between yourself at the CIA and the combat officer? Well, with the CIA, you come inside. That's another problem with uh, long association. I've got, now got 37 years with the CIA. I retired in 92, but I came back on 211. So it's been another 11 years that I've been working with the CIA since I, since I retired. And the CIA h hires uh, intelligent people who are not judgmental, who, who, are, who have convictions, who have moral convictions, but who are not so rigid, uh, because we have to get along with people. We have to recruit people, we have to manipulate people. Uh, in the clandestine service in the CIA, that's what you do. You make contact with people, you win them over with your manner, with your smile, uh, and then you get them to do what the U.S. government wants them to do. That's what you do in the CIA. So you get used to that kind of people that have a moral compass and who are smart. And then you lead the CIA and not everybody's like that yet. It's a little surprising. So I retired in 92 and when I went back to work in 2001, it was good to get back with all those people that I knew before. See. Um, so you were in Vietnam during the offensive. Did you deal with anything with that? No, uh, no, I was not there. I was there 65, 66, and then I came back 74, 75. Oh, I see, okay. So during all the Vietnamization war, everything you are not involved at all? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I, there was a war going on when I was there at 65. We were in a lot of combat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, you said you were a lot of combat. Any battle you still remember? And what did you remember? There was the Min Tron, the, the Min Tron Road. Min, M-I-N-H-T-R-A-N-H, -N Min Tron. It's north of the Michelin Plantation. It's in Tainan province. Tainan, okay. There's a road that runs close to the Cambodian border. And we had been there for about a year. And um, going, I think, up to Tainan, going, uh, a road convoy has always got ambushed in this area because it's so close to Cambodia. They could hit it, take the supplies off, and be in Cambodia. And so we staged a, um, an operation. And uh, Arvin was going to be in us. It was going to be led by the first calf. But most of my uh, battalion, most of my brigade, was waiting uh, some distance away. But we had helicopters by. And we 
uh, and we, but we let people know there's going to be this big convoy and we're taking ammunition and we're taking food uh, up this road. Um, and we hope that the, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese who were inside of Cambodia would hear about it, and they did. Uh, so when the lead element uh, almost got through, when most of the trucks were right here, is when they hit. And as soon as they hit, we had artillery firing, and we had jets that were coming in, strafing it, and we sent our whole brigade in here, close to where this first, first tank was, and we swept down that area. And the, Viet, uh, the North Vietnamese were piled up. Um, we killed hundreds and hundreds. Um, but we, we got about halfway through. Then I was working for uh, Colonel Haldane, and they brought a guy into our command group who had been wounded in the stomach. But it was one of those terrible, just a little blue mark. You could see where the bullet went in. But it was internal bleeding because his stomach was getting bloated up. It was like he was getting pregnant. So unless he got to a doctor soon, he was not going to live. So I took another walking wounded and another guy, the colonel, not I took, the colonel said, Parker, you take these guys out to the road. So this was here. Now the, uh, We've already shot them up pretty bad. But I, I was making my way from there across this area where there had been so many, and there were North Vietnamese that were uh, trying to sneak by that uh, were not wounded, but they were wounded, and some of them were dragging other people that were wounded. Uh, and they were sort, were sort of all together. And I wasn't, my job then was to get that guy and save his life. It was not to fight, because if I would shot at him, you know, they would have overpowered them. So he was making my way through. They were trying to get out of the battlefield, and I was trying to get that guy in the battlefield. But uh, we killed hundreds and hundreds of them there. So in the battle, uh, people told me in a simple book uh, um, wrote about it. I not particularly. Uh, I'm, I'm in English. Uh, I'm in American, right? English, but in Vietnamese, they said that um, several uh, North Vietnam soldier. In many battlefields, they would chain into their weapon or tank. Do you see anything like that? No, uh, but the the uh, the North Vietnamese had defections, uh, and there were people. But but th th I'm sure that happened. Uh, so did I personally see it? No, but do I think it happened? Yes, because there were some North Vietnamese that said, "No, I'm not going to go up there and die," uh, when. Groups had been dying. I mean, groups were going through it. Everybody's getting killed. Another group going up. Everybody getting killed. And then they tell this group to go up. Some guys said, "I'm not going to do it. No, not me." Uh, and then maybe they would shoot them, or maybe they would they would tie them, or or uh, or whatever. But um, if the political officer in a group was good, uh, then he could sway most anybody. And if he couldn't sway most anybody before they got to the battle, he would send them out. So before they got to the battle, if the political officers think this guy is not going to uh, charge and die, uh, get rid of him, send him out to do something else. Well, um, go away from Vietnam for a few years. You come back in 1974. Mm -hmm. Did you see any different uh, at that time compared with the time you was in Vietnam before? Well, when I was in Vietnam before, I was a soldier, I was a GI. I didn't have much personal contact. I don't know if I knew any, any Vietnamese at all. We had our interpreter uh, with the battalion, but uh, I didn't have any personal contact. When I came back, it was just all personal contact. And when I was down in Vietnam, I was the only American there. And that's why I got to be such good friends with General Hung. Uh, he's, his English wasn't that good. It was sort of halted. And he didn't speak loud, so you had to you had to pay attention to it. Uh, but he was my he was my best friend, I reckon, for people to talk to. Uh, my interpreters, mm, I would play ping pong with them, but to sit and talk with them, I would. So I would I would go over to see Joan Hong sometime to get information, find out what was going on. And he was completely candid. Anything going on in the southern part of. Vietnam, he would share. And sometimes we would just talk about things. He would ask about the family and uh, ask about things in the United States, about movies, uh, singers, that kind of thing. He sort of followed things. He was a Buddhist um, and he was just a good man. Uh, and But he spoke, spoke softly. 
smiled, had a real friendly smile, very sincere, um, and intelligent eyes, and he was a friend of mine. At the time, people in the South called him a hero of Anlock. Was you with him, and how? And Anlock? No. That would have been up in uh, Three Corps. No, I, was, I only knew him when he was down, 21st Division Commander. Mm -hmm. And then at the very end, he was the Deputy Commander of the Delta. I see. Uh, so I we uh, read on the book that you uh, wrote about um, the last m moment of this hero. Well, I got one question I want to ask Jim. Um, <laughs> I understand you really like going up in an old Cessna, like a O1, and flying over the countryside. You must have been, the plane must have been like this. Did I tell you that when I talked to the group or what? Well, I read it in your book, but I, I mean, I, my cousin was a FAC uh, pilot down in Vin Long, is that it? Long Vin, Vin Long? Vin Long. Vin Long. And uh, I'd go down and fly with him. And I, and I said afterwards, I must have been completely out of my mind. Because he was a jet jockey before they he made him a, a commander of the uh, of a he, he, He's talking about Laos. When I was there, I was a uh, CIA case officer, and I had GM, they were Monk, I had GM uh, 23. Well, I was doing something with the villagers first. Uh, and my GM were out close to the PDJ, Plain de Jars. Are you familiar with the PDJ? Mm -hmm. Now, to get to my men, uh, they were all Hmong Hills Tribe uh, guerrillas. Uh, there were Vietnamese uh, here, and there were some Vietnamese here. So you could either shoot the gap here, or you could come all the way around here. Now the problem in flying in Laos is you've got a lot of mountains, uh, and you got the smoke, and you got the clouds. So sometimes you come in here, and it's blocked. You can't you can't do it. Now do you go do you go across the? Enemy? I'm talking about helicopters because I I would go out every day. Uh, do you cut across, sneak across here and try and get in? We got shot at almost every day. Um, but the idea was to stay away from where they had any aircraft guns like Jane Fonda was on. Well, so my, my orientation when I'm up in the air in those helicopters is to stay away from the bad guy. Uh, we had what we call Ravens, and they flew in these little Cessna 01s. And their job was to go up and find the enemy because we got in sometimes 200 sorties of, uh, of fast movers a day to find the enemies and they would shoot smoke uh, down and then the jets would bomb. So sometimes if they got a short notice that some jet fighters were on the way, uh, they would be out of my area and say, come on mule, where are some uh, bad guys? And you say, well, you give them some coordinates. And they would dive down dive down to try and get the North Vietnamese to fire at them so they could put some smoke yeah. on them and fight. So that's, they're trying to get people to fire at them. They were the Ravens. Uh, but the Ravens also would have coordinates. They'd have some fast movers come in and they'd shoot from high. They weren't always challenging death, but they did a lot. I and mean, we lost a lot of Ravens. So one day, H. Ornsby, who is still a friend, I still see him, uh, was a Raven. Uh, it was a slow day and i just come in, or so, I don't know, I was on the ramp. He said, well, let's go fly it. So I get in the back seat of this little Raven plane, right? And my orientation always before is to stay away from us. He goes flying over the PDJ, flying over all these positions with all the antichrist, singing and talking and, and then dipping down. And, and sometimes you had the mountains, there were these wind flows, you know, these, and he'd go down and get baffled around. And, and sometimes it, uh, the top of the ridge, you had to be careful because if the enemy got up there and you were low, they're shooting down on you in this bed. And he was flying below that. I was so scared. I was, I was almost pissing in my pants. I was so afraid I couldn't talk. I was just mortified in the back, sweating, turned white, uh, hands clenching on the th thing. And he was saying, Mule, how come you're not talking? Mule, how come you're not talking? I try and talk, and my voice would be, I don't know, no, no. <laughs> and he came back and landed in the long chair. Never again. So um, you would stay very late uh, you know, in uh, Vietnam, even after Saigon fell. What you tried to do and how, what you have accomplished? Well, we had identified the what we call KIP. And some, 
Some we couldn't contact. Um, maybe one or two we couldn't contact. Um, we we were looking for a small group, but then when we talked about taking the people out, so I got to take my family. I'm not coming by myself. Uh, so we ended up with more than 100, 117, I think, uh, although the right numbers in my book. And we told them, uh, uh, Rocky Al and Chadok, uh, and we told them we were going to move them to Tansunut. We we're going to put them in a safe area so they could they could leave the country. Uh, so as not to give away our plan, but our plan was to pick them up and just go out to the Navy because we knew there were hundreds of U.S. Navy ships uh, off the shore, and I was just going to find a boat. And we were down to about four guys, and since I knew Air America, I was going to be uh, working that guy. But there's another guy named McDonald and another guy named Sarge. Um, so we told the people in Chaduck to, to wait. We told the people in Rocky to wait. We got everybody in Canto. And we sent somebody, because Martin had said, nobody is to be evacuated on U.S. Uh, uh, planes. Nobody. So we sent Roosevelt, this, this guy from the Delta, up, and he was going to try and get in to see Ambassador Martin. Uh, but he had that, that drill sergeant of a secretary who was keeping everybody out. So he, there was a guy named Jacobson, who was Martin's right-hand man. So Glenn said something about getting people out. It's getting down to the last minute. And, and Jacobson said something which maybe you could construe to be, okay, it's okay to go. So it's whatever Jacobson said. He gave us a call and said, okay, go with it. So we picked up, I got on the Air America uh, helicopter with, with uh, George Saylor. And we went out and I picked up the first of the group from, uh, from Chaduck who thought they were going to Tansanut. And then we start flying out towards the ocean, and one of the guys came out who spoke good English. And he said, where are we going? We've got to go to Tonsonut. And I said, no, we're going out to ships. No, he said. Uh, I've got somebody going to meet me in Tonsonut. We can't do that. Uh, we can't go to Tonsonut. And I told him, shut up. I didn't have time for that. So he was going out. And he would thank me later, but he had to shut up now. And he kept talking, and I just told him, shut up, move away. So we landed on the Navy boat. Uh, but it, this is all in my book, and I got out and had to go to the, talk to the commander. You know, who are you? Because, so you had all these ships out there, and then this one ship pulled out, and on the back, it had a, a place for a helicopter to land. So George landed, and George said, they want to talk to, to you, mule. Uh, so I had on the earphones, so I put the earphones up, and went out, and the commander said, who, is, who are these people? And I said, um, I'm with the CIA, and they are... Uh, they're, the people were getting out. The ambassador has authorized it. And he said, who? And I said, Jacobson. Go to the embassy and this guy, Jacobson, will say all this is authorized. It wasn't authorized. It was just taken on, on the notion. So the first people that got out were maybe mm, 12 or 14. Some of them older, some of them younger, some of them babies. And I said they'd worked for the CIA. And, and the Marines, uh, I don't believe they should have been. So then I flew back, and in Canto, I was organizing the helicopters going out, and they picked up 117 people. Well, I wanted the, the helicopter to land on top of this building where we were staying, downtown Canto. Uh, we cut some trees down so we could land. But uh, the pilot then, I don't think it was George anymore. I think George had gone, some, gone back to Saigon. So he wasn't sure how to get in. This was the last helicopter of the day. So I went with him, and we landed on the boat, and the Marines came and got me. And they said the captain wanted to talk to me. So I went up to the, see the captain, and the captain said, nobody in Saigon knows anything about these people. And I don't believe you. I don't believe they are CIA agents, because there were still mothers and grandmothers and the little babies there with, with the people. Plus. There were some of them that we had taken from the field, and they really looked rough. Some of the people we had, there was a guy named, um, I forgot his name, he was Cambodian, but he really looked tough. And he had lived by his wits uh, in Cambodia. But, um, and, he, and the captain said, most of the men were armed, and they had knives, and then they had knives and knives. Uh, knives, it must have been a knife inside of a handle or something. Knives and knives, he said. So he said, this is what I'm doing. He said, you're not going in with the helicopter. Go tell the helicopter to leave. You're going to take these people, and you're going to go to that boat. There's a merchant marine ship over there, and you're going to take those people, and you're going to go to that boat, 
and uh, I'm going to get you off here and I'm going to go because nobody knows anything about this. And it was just all bullshit this morning. And I bought you bullshit. So I went and told whoever the pilot was to leave and I went down and the Marines had gotten my people, 117 of them, and they had guns on them and they had them in a corner. And uh, who was my guy? I don't know if, yeah. But anyway, they had some landing boats. So we got in the landing boats, uh, all of my 117. I was like the Pied Piper. Uh, and we went over to the Pioneer Contender. And uh, they sent down these baskets and pulled the people up. And uh, I had to go talk to the captain. He said, who the hell are you? And what, what are these people doing here? And I said, uh, well, I'm with the CIA and they're CIA people. That little girl CIA person? Uh, yeah. Well, he said, he, he was once, he went up um, the coast a month or so before and was taken over by Marines or something and coming back down. And uh, so he said, is this going to be some of that? I said, look at them. Are they going to take over your boat? So uh, they were down in one of the holds. I was going to go down and stay with them, but the captain gave me a cabin. And the cook. But I think the crew sort of liked these 117 people uh, because they brought them food and the people were scared. And uh, they thought they were going to Tonsonut and now uh, they had the Marines that were pointing guns at them and now they're on the Pioneer Contender. Uh, and because everything was good when they left Chaduck and Rocky out. They left because we told them to leave. They were picked up, they were thinking they were going to, to, to to Tonsonda, and now they're in, the, they had that experience, and now they're on this, and they were, um, uh, they were tired. But the next, the next morning we woke up, because the Navy guy said he'd come by and pick me up the next morning. No, there's no Navy ships, just a Pioneer contender there. But we had the short wave uh, radio, and we heard that Saigon was being evacuated, and the North Vietnamese were occupying Saigon. So the people then sort of realized they were lucky. They were very lucky to get out. So um, you have some technical term, and I like you to explain. You said "keep." What does that mean, sir? Key indigenous personnel, uh -huh. because we had a lot of people that worked for us in the Delta. Uh, some of them were guards. We couldn't take any of our guards that we liked a lot. Uh, the maids, the other people that had worked for us, they were not KIP, KIP, key indigenous personnel. There were people who knew that we were CIA, and they had either done CIA work or they knew uh, people who had. These people, would you think that if the uh, VC know them, they would They would shoot it? them for sure. Yeah. That, was what, that was one of the re requirements to keep, that if the, if, if the Viet, when the Vietnamese came in, uh, they would arrest these people and shoot them. There would be no uh, re-education camp, they would shoot these people. So, and you're talking about we have four uh, region, uh, and you number four, and every region have a guy like you and evacuate his own people. But it yeah. happened so fast. I, I think we were the only people who came up with a KIP list. Mm -hmm. And we were doing it all ourselves. Mm -hmm. Jim Delaney was my boss. And when we, when General High said Saigon will fall in seven days, then we said, well, what do we do? Uh, well, first, let's identify our KIP and let's get them so we can get our hands on them and get them out. And then, I think my job, well, I was, I was helping in getting these people identified and getting them together, but was to get the Air America pilots lined up that was going to do our work. So I told George and told a couple other guys, this is our plan. You got to help me. You got to be here. Uh, I got to use you. So it was only, I think if it had been somebody Air America hadn't have known, they would have obeyed their bosses and that would have been go back to Saigon, so we wouldn't have got them out. So um, you uh, were busy to try to ev evacuate your people? Another thing too is I went over to, um, to Hung's headquarters and um, to offer him a ride out. Uh, and I didn't get to see him, I didn't get the offer. But I knew he wasn't going to do it, but I felt I ought to get him out. And remember from the book too, I had promised this woman I was going to get her two kids out. And because the Navy captain took me off the helicopter. I, I didn't get the kids out, so, but I'm sure they got out. So his wife uh, and the two children, uh, you, you got a chance to talk to them in person that I will bring you out? How's that work? But no, that's separate. I went to General High's headquarters, uh, uh, General Holmes' headquarters to offer him uh, uh, a trip out, but I never got to see him. 
so I never have to. But then there was this woman who had come to the consulate, and she had two uh, American Asian, American Vietnamese kids, oh. and she was the one I couldn't, I never, I said, okay, I'll get your kids out. Don't worry, I'll get your kids out. So, uh, what it looked like uh, at that time, I'm talking about Vietnam, how, uh, people tried to get out, how chaotic was it? Oh, uh, well, so we ended up on the Pioneer Contender, and then down the river came the Kanjian, a guy named McNamara, who we were just talking about, Terry McNamara. Uh, so, and I'm listening to, we're listening to the, the ship Pioneer Contender radio, and apparently the people were um, the refugees, the people who had worked for the Americans, the people who were trying to get out, were going to Vung Tau uh, to get out. So the two landing boats came up. If they were having trouble, and they were having trouble getting all these people out to ships because there were ships that, was, that had room and they were going to take them. So uh, I got two uh, Filipino guys and this other Cambodian guy, and we drove those two all the way to Vung Tau overnight. So when the sun comes up the next morning, we're right outside of Vung Tau. And um, the place was, um, it was, um, it was chaos. You had thousands of people on, on the beach and on this pier coming out. People just mashed together. And you, they had this, um, this raft, you know, a raft, and a tugboat was pushing that in. And it would fill up with people and he was bringing it to one boat and then he would bring it to the Pioneer Contender. But people trying to get on that raft, uh, some of them were falling in the, in the water. And then the rounds started coming in. The Vietnamese began to... And then there was a fire on, uh, on shore, so that smoke was drifting in. But there were so many people, we were some distance away, um, a mile away, less than a mile, let's say three quarters of a mile wh where I was. And the wail of the people, hot screaming of uh, individual names, or jump, they had to jump up, jump down. They had to get on to the raft. And then the tugboat would, would push away. But there's nobody out there trying to monitor the people. But if, if my landing boat that I had had pulled in, they would have swamped it. Swamped it, and they would have swamped me. I didn't have any, I was exposed uh, out there. So me going in to pick up the people. Uh, Plus, the, there was an Australian with a big tugboat, and it was called Tugboat Control. He said, we've just about loaded up all the ships, but there's still thousands of people. But you're asking about if there's anything that I remember now that I didn't put in the book. So I'm standing on the Pioneer Contender, and I'm, I'm watching this, and I'm remembering, because I had five years uh, there in Southeast Asia, in Laos and in Vietnam, thinking about the people that I know, uh, about the struggle, and whether it was worthwhile. But I look to the left, and Vung Tau was here, and the Saigon River goes in here. And there were, there were ships that were going in. These were commercial ships that were going in to offload at Saigon. So we had the war that was coming to an end. And we had a lot of people that were trying to get out. And then the North Vietnamese, but not everybody. 100% of the people were not affected. There were still boats coming in. There were still taxis that were running in Saigon. There were still some shops in Saigon that were open. There were tailors that were working. And there were people in the marketplace still selling their goods. It wasn't like everybody in South Vietnam because these ships were, were going up the Saigon River. Because I asked the captain, what are those boats? Um, because it seemed like me, everybody was involved in this. And he, there were commercial ships that were loaded that were going to offload their, their merchandise. So it wasn't that the world had stopped and that it was the end uh, of world. It was, it was the end of that. And for some people, like those sent to the re-education camp, and I'm sure that there were some people that, that they just uh, eliminated. For some of those, it was the end. But for, you were there. Uh, so life went on. It wasn't as good as it was before. And, you, and there was better life someplace else, but it wasn't the end of life. But for me, at the sense, I had the sense, that's the end. It is the end. Um, but it's tough. Life goes on. As bad as things might, might be, as bad as they might seem, life goes on. So um, you have evacuated. you think that um, all people have worked under you? 
uh, you have any friend that left behind you can bring with you and you feel regret? Yes, Loy, who was my, my bodyguard. When I was, I was the only guy left in Viton, and you, you couldn't drive from Viton to Canto because the VC owned the road. Uh, if the VC wanted to come and get my sorry ass, they could. If they wanted to come and shoot me, they could. Uh, so my boss said, uh, you going to be okay down there? And I said, yeah. No, 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 no. But I went down and saw Loy, and I said, Loy, I'm the only American here now. Your job used to be chief guard. Your job is now my bodyguard. You're, you've got to get between me and danger. If I am here and danger is over there, I want you here someplace. If I get killed, I want to find you in line in front of me uh, going to heaven or to hell or whatever it is. Your job is to protect me. And Loy said, all right, all right, all right. You Vietnamese? Yeah, Mega. No, he was, he, Vietnamese are Nung. Oh, we had some of the Nung, but I th oh, Is Loy a uh, Vietnamese name? No, Lloyd, not in Vietnamese. Uh, well, I've got a picture of it. Uh, My dad's name is Lloyd. Oh, yeah? It's Lloyd, yeah? Uh, Lloyd, yeah, huh? Lloyd. Oh, L-O-I? L-O-I. Oh, that's Lloyd, yeah, that's Vietnamese. That's okay, Vietnamese. You, you can tell me if he's Vietnamese. Uh, but Lloyd was my, he was my buddy down there. Hong was my... Uh, but you've seen these pictures, that, that's Lloyd. Yep. Okay. Is he Vietnamese or? Vietnamese, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. Uh, and that was sad too. When, uh, but he wasn't killed because um, we decided no bodyguards are killed. So I paid off uh, uh, my two interpreters, uh, I think, were killed. So they uh, were going to Canto, but Loy, I just had to pay and told him to go home. So I gave him a lot of money. This is in Vuitton. But he ended up back in Canto. And... Uh, you never get out? I'm sure he got out. Uh, you find him? No, no I haven't found him. Yeah. But if you run across anybody that looks like him, I know I am. I work. think I have aged a little bit. I look for him and I come okay. back and I ask a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, do it, do that, do that, do that. Okay. So, uh, uh, so Loy... Uh, Oh, I didn't get in. So, um, you have family at that time, and you try to get people out of danger. Um, it's very dangerous for you because you, uh, you know, American there, they could kill you, but you sit, boom, that's it. What it went in your mind while you doing, doing all that? When I was at uh, Long Chin, uh, that's working with the Hmong, there were only about 12 of us, and we were working, uh, we were fighting the war, but there were just about 12 CIA case officers. And uh, we had been recruited. We had to take a lot of tests. I had to take a whole week of tests, psychological tests, and and all that kind of stuff. Um, they uh, well, let me let me, let me uh, explain it another way. As I was getting ready to go to Vietnam the first time, there was a um, uh, was a group of officers, and then we had some guys that had been in the Second World War. So this was in '65, and they'd been in the Second World War in '45. So these guys were older. This one guy got up and said, to be effective in combat, you gotta be, you gotta be courageous. You gotta be able to stand up uh, when people are shooting at you and direct your men. You've got to show courage. If you show courage, your men will have courage. If you don't have courage, the men will not have courage. But you have to have courage. And, and he said, but here's the thing. What if you're not a risk taker? What if you don't have a lot of courage? He said, fake it, fake it, it looks the same. So going, as we were going to Vietnam, um, I thought about that and it gave me uh, courage. I mean, it gave me, because I wondered, how, what, what am I gonna do when somebody shoots at me? Am I gonna be afraid? Am I gonna wet my pants? What, what if I get in, in, in combat and I start crying or see somebody wounded and, and break down? But I, I remember what they, that sergeant said, fake it. So I was going to fake courage. But I found, Nancy, after a two or three firefights, that the people who faked courage got shot. Because if you stand up just to do something, you're going to get shot. The man who is a good commander is the one who waits a second or two seconds and figures things out. 
who doesn't try to fake courage, who is a risk taker and he's calculated um, and he makes decision and he has good judgment. It's and it's the same thing about, um, you know, women are not very good uh, fighter pilots because I think women have a nested instinct. They want to they have a family. They want to have kids. Uh, they, want to, they want to be the providers of the family. Where men are the hunters and, and, and uh, uh, providers. And, uh, the men have the instincts uh, for that kind of thing. When they had women pilots, they were trying to fake courage, I think. And it wasn't, wasn't very good. When I was in Long Chin, so I'm with 12 other guys, and we sort of all understood that, and we liked, we liked combat. Um, there's a terrible side to combat where you lose friends and men die, but we like to hear the sound of guns. Although Brenda will tell you I would come back to Vien Chin and would night walk. I'd get up and walk around. I'd have a drink or two and sit up on the edge of the bed and rock back and forth because we got shot at every day. But I enjoyed, I, en, I enjoyed the combat. I enjoyed rounds going off. I enjoyed going down to the ramp and, and dealing with the North Vietnamese uh, every day. So I was there five years because I enjoyed that kind of stuff. And the, there were other CIA people I served with who also enjoyed not only combat, but that sort of violent uh, war environment. Uh, and th they were, you, you would find that across the board. There were, there were Hmong who sort of enjoyed it, other Hmong didn't want anything, in Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, who enjoyed it, others didn't. Hmm? Okay, good. I have a question related to people over mm -hmm. here. They always complain about eh, another Vietnam War. What do you recommend? I, what is your advice for them when they say so? What does that mean? She needed Okay. 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 So in the uh, U.S. now, anytime that uh, we involved with any war, you hear, here he go again, another Vietnam War. What, what do you have um, to, uh, you know, to advise them about that term? What is that like? Well, when I went to Vietnam in um, 1965, and it is now uh, 2012. That's what um, 30. 50 years ago? Yeah, almost. Oh, no. Almost, almost. 50 almost. Years. It'll be 50, three more years, it'll be 50. Yes, oh. yeah. Does that make don't me remind, old or what? Don't remind me. Do I look old? You Do I look old? old? <laughs> <laughs> you still look very young, sir. Uh, <laughs> but when we went to uh, Vietnam, there were three and a half billion people on the face of this good earth. Three and a half billion people. That was the world population. Now there are over 7 billion. The world population has doubled since we went to Vietnam. Um, it used to be that we uh, were in a Cold War and there were people who, communists, who wanted to take over the world. But that's no longer the case. You don't have political, um, uh, political efforts to take over the world or military efforts to take over the world. You have economic, the Chinese are involved in economic efforts uh, to take over the world. Uh, but there's not the political and military like there was before, and they never will be, I don't think, again. Will there be brush fires here and there? Um, I think so. Um, but we have to keep in mind that the majority of that increase in population, which is more than double, three and a half billion people, are not educated. They come from uh, cultures and countries where they are not educated, uh, and they're not industrious, and they don't have training. They have no training. Um, so the, the uh, threats to our national security is going to come from these dumb masses out there. And how do we deal with that? Now, the, the, the population explosion uh, also explains the mass migration, I think, from Latin America. People are coming here because there's not enough work for them. And, and they have these large families, and, and so they come up here. It's going to be different for our children. Uh, what they have to face and what they have to fight. There will never be another um, another Vietnam, and for me there'll be another, there'll never be another Laos. Uh, Iraq and, a, uh, and, a, and Iran or Afghanistan, I just, the Iraq war was not like we had in Vietnam. Um, 
and it's going to it's going to be uh, different. And the enemies, as I said, to our security are not people. It's not like Russia and China. It's these thousands of people from outlaw countries. You go into East Africa, and there are a lot of countries. The government only handles the city. The people they have no control. They have no influence out in the countryside. Um, we we should be very fortunate if we're in the United States. We ought to um, embrace the freedoms we have. We ought to appreciate them uh, more and just be thankful that we are here. And we have the opportunity to bring relatives in so they can also enjoy it. But we cannot, the United States cannot go out and be the world's policeman like it has before. Um, because it's big numbers and, and, and to deal with them, it's, we, don't, we don't have any any tactics on the shelf to use. So will you do it again if uh, Vietnam War happened again? Will you do it again? Well, I tell you, I, I enjoy that kind of stuff. Uh, I enjoyed leading men in combat. I enjoyed Laos at the very end in, uh, in uh, Vietnam. Uh, I enjoyed that. But see, I was young too. You have more testosterone. You have more vigor uh, now, but still, I enjoyed I enjoyed my two years in Afghanistan. I enjoyed working the people. It's interesting too. Uh, the, our work, intelligence works. It doesn't change much over time. It changes in Afghanistan because they're so uneducated and they're so stupid, and they're stupid in a crazy way, Nancy. Uh, they they marry cousins for generations and gener and the smaller tribes the, and they they're very tribal. The men don't have the choices for wives, so they're marrying somebody that's related to them. There's almost no unrelated marriages in the smaller tribes, so they're crazy now. And after a while, they're crazy in a way you can't understand. They're they're crazy in a way that they will send their youngest child off to blow himself up, and that that's he's a hero to the family. So, um, anything that you want to say and I didn't ask you yet? That, um, that the, the, the Vietnamese uh, people were, uh, they are, are handsome, intelligent people um, that adapt very well to American ideals of democracy, um, who are making our country stronger. Uh, in almost every case, almost every Vietnamese that, have, that has come over, especially those who spent some time in Vietnam, make ours a better country. Now, can we say that of all the people who have, all the immigrants who have come in? I'm not so sure. But I know when it comes to the, to the Vietnam, and I don't know any other country, maybe the Filipinos a little bit, uh, but nobody, to my mind, stands out as being an immediate uh, improvement to, and, and who appreciate the freedoms and who uh, who add uh, to to the great value of living in the United States. Uh, it was almost a country uh, built where you could you could excel. It's it's a structure that the Vietnamese mindset can get in and excel. Uh, but I, I have great love for the, the Vietnamese that I knew. Not so much the first time because I didn't know them, I was a GI. But the second time going out uh, in Chow Doc and then in Vietnam, there's something about by yourself where uh, it's just all Vietnamese. You get to know them in, in, a, in a more intimate and a personal way uh, and great respect for, for, for the people there. And I am so happy uh, and, and so proud to see uh, Vietnamese as American citizens. So what do you think about South Vietnam Army? Were they a good fighter, a good ally? With good leaders. Yeah. With good leaders every single, every single time they were, they were good soldiers. Um, but there when the North Vietnamese were so overpowering and pushing down at the end, uh, I think they were good leaders, but there's so many bad leaders and guys that were just trying to get out. Uh, but the United States, and in that regards, uh, we should feel proud. You know, we did everything we could to, to set up the army so you could, so the South Vietnamese army could defend itself. Uh, 
But by the end, I interview many soldier, Vietnamese uh, former soldier. They said that they didn't have. By the end, they didn't have bullets, ammunition. Don't have gas for their tank for their airplane. Maybe that's true too. Maybe that's true too. I know that's what Hai was saying down at, uh, and even Hong. They didn't have the right supplies at the end. Uh, I think, to a certain extent, the politicians, if if the news media um, helped in uh, in in our loss in South Vietnam, American politicians also contributed. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm I'm sorry to hear that, but. Uh, I'm sure there were instances where some of the soldiers ran out of bullets. But I remember the problem in, in the Delta was helicopters. And they had a lot of helicopters, but they were running out of spare parts. There wasn't a shortage of bullets. It was spare parts for the helicopters that sort of grounded them. And by the end, they don't have gasoline to mm. fly it either. Any regret from that war that you wish you can do for it and you, you didn't? I wish I had gone to Lyndon Johnson in 65 and said what you have to do is you have to stop the supply line coming in. <clears throat> I wish somebody had, uh, had talked to him. Turn off that television and turn it over. Don't try and... Another thing too, the United States President was trying to run the war from the White House. Give it to somebody over there. Hold them responsible and stay out of it. You're not a soldier. At the end it was Ford and Kissinger. And they were neither one soldiers. They didn't know what they were doing. Uh, mm. But uh, yeah, I wish we had fought it a little better. I wish the CIA, at one time, uh, let's say 63, um, you, had, you had China and we had the Korean War. Uh, you had North Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh uh, developing uh, uh, a communist state. Eisenhower was worried about the domino theory that they were going to, uh, the dominoes were, were, were going to fall. Um, I wish somebody had said, CIA go in and, uh, and stop that, handle it. I think we could have done it. Um, I forgot to add this question about the linebacker that we bombed uh, Hanoi at the end of, I think, Christmas of 1972 uh, and 73. Uh, and um, several people said that uh, uh, the North Vietnam come very close to defeat. And as a matter of fact, some guy, I forgot the name, I tried to get a name for me because I, I stored in here and I couldn't find. He even said that, uh, you know, the intelligence, and you one of the intelligence officer, received the defeat uh, word from North Vietnam, but at that time they ignored it because I've, I've also heard the Christmas bombing, if it had been continued for another month. Mm -hmm. North, another day. Uh, well, maybe another day. I don't know. I heard, well, I don't know. Mm -hmm. If it had been continued for a little bit more time, they would have given up. They already wrote, uh, uh, from, I would stay back four years, and then some of the people from the North um, talked to my friend, and my friend invited me over there and listened to him. He said that they, uh, the defeat speed already written. So it just need another day or two, you know, they only surrender. Yeah. Uh, so. And Bui Tin kind of said that too. Yeah, Bui Tin, the, the um, colonel, the colonel. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know from personal hand, but I have read it once or twice, yeah. that the Vietnamese have said, and this is from North Vietnamese, if that had, Christmas bombing had been continued. Uh, well, you had, you had mined the harbors at that time too, right? Yeah. Hai Phong was mined. They, nothing was getting in or getting out. But you know, they, they had spent themselves on Tet. If Walter Cronkite hadn't have been there, yeah. Lyndon Johnson had come and said, we whipped their ass. Yep. Don't, uh, don't mm -hmm. believe what Walter Cronkite said. They lost, uh, how many did they lose? Um, for for um, South Vietnam, maybe there is, or Vietnam, maybe, the, maybe there's a future. Time goes by quickly. If that, if that war was 50 years ago, 40 years ago, in another 40 years, it's going to be a whole new generation. It's almost a whole new generation now. Uh, and communism just doesn't work. It doesn't allow the freedoms that, uh, that a democracy uh, does. 
that we might find that it will be a democracy. And if it is a democracy, I think America is still uh, looked on favorably in Vietnam. Now they come back to Vietnam, big time. Yeah. I see a lot of. Uh, Officer, uh, Viet, Viet, uh, I mean, but, communist. But how about the people in Vietnam? Do they like Americans? They love Americans. Over Even Europeans? Not, over European, they trust. Over Russians? Over Russian. They only trust Americans. One of the one time I I was teaching, like I told you uh, why the communists came, and then um, I would uh, you know like summer training, and then one, one guy came in and he make a comment like this. He said only America can do it. So I look at him and said, "So why we have to spend that much time and blood and everything else uh, in a war?" You know. So he look around, see if anybody <laughs> what he said beside a few of us. Mm. Uh, so uh, deep down inside, they love America. Yeah. Love American wood. Everything about America. Even we, you know, uh, expat from America better than expat from France and every, everywhere else. So. Yeah. That, that, uh, well, I think Brenda and I found that when we went in '97 or '98, is yeah. that uh, there was there was warm there's a warmness yeah. uh, with the uh, with the South Vietnamese people we met in Saigon. Of course, we had money, so it was warm. Even even the North, I, I understand <laughs> that. But even you don't have money. Two guys, Russian and American, you you both have equally no money. Yeah. They still love you. Mm -hmm. uh, um, when uh, when Clinton came to Vietnam, over thirty thousand people stand up the highway. That the uh, uh, communists didn't want us to have that happen. They oh, tried really? their best to Bill hide or the news. Hillary. <laughs> Clinton, two thousand. Yeah. Bill or Hillary? Hillary or Bill? Bill, Bill Clinton. Yeah. Uh, ah. he, was teasing, he was teasing you. No, I, no, I wasn't. But they're all girls, huh? <laughs> no, a good boy, the young man. <laughs> hey, they're all girls. He, he tried to trap me. Yeah, that was good. I'm naive. I don't know. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> but um, yes, uh, to answer your question, Vietnamese people, I don't talk about government. I don't talk about communists. I talk about people, and the people is about. 80 millions, why the government or anybody have the thing to do with them? About 3 million, you know, so they're different there. They look uh, American, yes. Well, you know, the, the, the Minister of Defense, the uh, Secretary of Defense was just over there and got a good reception. He was talking about opening a military base in uh, Tainan or something. Cameron Bay. Cameron Bay. Open to me, up. they still are very much scared of American because they're talking about they worry about the revolution, mm. uh, quote unquote, and um, but they they know that uh, America is much better than Chinese. Oh know, yeah, so, uh, they're still fighting the Chinese, right? Yeah. Somebody told me they lost some provinces in the north to the Chinese. Uh, they uh, they have to cut uh, mm. land to the Chinese, mm. and uh, the the war uh, seventy nine killed thirty four thousand Vietnamese uh, up at the border of Vietnam and right. China. So, that many, huh? That many. And um, yeah, and but the uh, uh, North Vietnam and China has never gotten along, right? No, no, never. Yeah, we uh, n not that. That's why um, somebody made comment that uh, oh, during the war, American always scare of Chinese. They worry that Chinese yes. will come in yes, and help yes, and, yes, and yeah. that. Not but only they, Chinese, but the Russian too. Yeah. We're, we're afraid of that. Yeah, mm, but Chinese are very close. But they didn't know that. Vietnamese and Chinese hate each other to the bone, for, you know, and never change. But <coughs> now, when the communists come, they have to help each other. They have, but the people to the people, you know, yeah. they never, they never trust uh, Chinese. It it seems like that that there is, if we had stayed there, if if even as a soldier, you had to go over until the war was over. I think it would have forced the politician to have uh, resolved it. But the longer you stay, mm, the more you understand. Uh, what goes on, especially for managers, not just the soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. But, so, uh, so I'd like you to make some comment about the White Christmas in April. Did you hear that song? Uh, or did you know anything about that? Uh, it's, it's what they played in Saigon to tell everybody to go to evacuation points. Did you he hear that in, by your own ears? And no, no, no. We were down in the Delta. No, Delta. we didn't have that. I see. But, uh, you know, that's the way they were going to set up evacuation. They were going to play that song. People would go to evacuation points. They were using. They were going to use all these uh, helicopters.
helicopters to take people out, but it really broke down and then the crowds were uh, taken over. Mm -hmm. No, we had the people we were going to get out and we were down very small. We had mm, six people at the end. It's in my book, I don't know. We only had six CIA people uh, in the whole Delta. Uh, and our job was to get the 117 uh, people out and, and everything like we had said. We had destroyed all of our paper, with all traces of the CIA was, was gone. You did well on that, we, uh, uh, right, we know uh, that. Um, after the war, the communists, like, you know, that uh, uh, put all officers and then also anybody who work for old government or have any relation with uh, U.S. in, in jail. Uh, education camp, they call re education camp across the country. They, there's a, Putin said that about one million people at that time, and then many would die, uh, would die in the, uh, in prison, and they bury somewhere, uh, somewhere that their family now still search for their remains. Uh, and uh, people like me, you know, uh, over two million uh, across, I mean, across the uh, ocean, and half, over half million die in the ocean uh, by pirate hungry and you know lost lost everything else. Um, do you uh, have any sympathy or what do you think about those? You know that is the result of the defeat of Vietnam War. Not just the people in the country suffer, but you know many die. They die when the peace already came. Mm. I I think one one case when you know somebody, one person has done it, then it is a tragedy. When it's 500,000, it's, it's almost uh, statistics. But uh, man's inhumanity to man, I saw that with Pol Pot in Cambodia. Uh, the millions of people killed in China. Um, so, um, nobody said life was going to be fair. Uh, there's no guarantee that life is fair. If there's any place where it is more fair than any place else, it's in America, in Canada maybe. Uh, you travel around the world. It's, it's what I'm saying about what a great country we have. Sure, we have a lot of problems. There are a lot of problems in the United States. But then that's human nature almost. But if there's one place where uh, you can... Um, uh, you are free of things like that. It's not possible here in the United States for there to be that mass kind of inhumanity. It is not possible in the United States that I know of to have that kind of uh, brutal uh, repression. It's not possible. People would, in this neighborhood, in your neighborhood where you're from, would not allow it. Uh, it's, it's part of the fabric of our country in a way that you wouldn't find in other places, maybe. So back to uh, Ho Chi Minh, that uh, he didn't uh, directly kill people, and you said that it was a statistic, but myself, I traveled to um, Southeast Asia uh, last May, mm. and I found several, I mean, like, uninhabited island in Indonesia. I found three, four hundred graves of both people died. That people already reached in to the land and they mm. died because that uh, inhabitant have no good water mm. and they're waiting for a rescue but they have no rescue, they died there. Mm. Uh, people perish on the ocean, uh, you know, kill. I have friend like uh, go with a hundred, um, you know, of uh, his friend and then all kill and he the sole survivor mm -hmm. and uh, many, many uh, people, I mean, would rip, kill, and then uh, bury in a mass grave in Malaysia, and uh, we we have that own film. So I mean, for the graveyards, the the burial places, right? Yes, yeah, the mass grave. Right. Because they 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 both uh, sink or or they go throw into the ocean, and then mm. they I mean, water bring them into the shore, and the villager there gather all the body and sometimes they have the name uh, the number of the bow number and they put all in one grain and said from Vietnamese uh, bow people from bow number one two three for instance uh, now over there in um, Southeast Asia places um, you know countries um, so I don't think that's statistic at all it's, mm. it, it's, it's a true um, and uh, if Ho Chi Minh didn't import 
um, communism into my country. I don't think that could happen, you know. So I he didn't do it. That he didn't he, not like Pol Pot. He executed. Me. But but uh, but you had the French. Excuse the French. If the French are gone, mm -hmm. um, what is going to fill up that vacuum? Uh, you, you can't go and rewrite history. I understand that. But Malaysia, all the country that under colonists, they have opportunity to review their country right, right. in uh, like capitalism uh, system. Uh, because he brought this and you know communism, they come, my, my, my grandpa was stoned to death because he was one of pioneers. He went to Upper Highland and he, you know, um, uh, he and 10 out of uh, friends, I mean, uh, cultivate and make that area become a livable, I mean, uh, habitat. And Ho Chi Minh, uh, a few times uh, when he still fighting with friends, uh, went to there and my uh, grandfather, uh, I mean, housed them and feed them. And uh, when they won, you know, they just kill all the call, they call uh, revolution, um, uh, land reform. They kill my grandfather by having him and have like people court and mm. uh, his servant, everybody come and spit on him and cursing him and throw, stone him until he uh, almost died. And my, on my, my uncle, they put him in a prison, my aunt brought him home and he died at, at that night. Mm. And she had two hours to bury my grandpa. Mm -hmm. So that what Ho Chi Minh did uh, to his friend, you know, who already have him during uh, his fought with mm -hmm. a good friend. So, you know, that's uh, I don't think that many foreigners understand uh, deep enough about Ho Chi Minh. You know, so if some young uh, people wanna join CIA today, what you gonna tell him or her? Um. Well, 9-11, the CIA strength, 9-11, uh, September the 11th, 2001, the CIA strength was down very low. Um, when that happened, uh, there were thousands and thousands of applications of people who wanted to join the CIA. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, everybody wanted to join the military. Uh, I don't know if they, uh, there were a lot of people that wanted to join the military after 9-11 probably, but there were also a lot of people who applied for the CIA. So the strength is up now very, uh, very high. Um, and it's very difficult to get in. Um, 2001, 2002, we were looking for people. We were begging people. But now it's almost up at, at full strength. Um, th there is, there, to, 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 to get into the CIA, so it's very difficult. Mm -mm. What is, uh, what is helpful is to have a foreign language uh, and to have some U.S. military uh, behind them. Uh, so the CIA is difficult to get in and you need a little bit of age. Uh, the optimum age to come in is 27, 28. So if you, are, if you would like to get into the CIA, um, but, but here, whether you join the CIA or not, there is a large, uh, there are large government uh, opportunities to fight terrorism and that's going to be for the future so if you're if you if you're talking to somebody who says I want to do something to help the United States to help my people uh, here uh, the CIA is a possibility it's difficult to get in now but there are other and you can start uh, with the military uh, go to uh, and go to community college uh, if you have to uh, graduate from a state college uh, join the military for two or three years and uh, make contacts and you can go uh, maybe to somebody before you join uh, the CIA. But the, the big draw now is in cyber war and when people project ahead um, that where we need uh, soldiers are people who are very good with IT in sort of a clever way, people that make games. Every day, Nancy, there are thousands, tens of thousands of people who sit down at computers in China, or Russia, and Iran who try to break into our national security systems. And we need people to counter that effort. Uh, there are jobs uh, available now in NSA and, and other organizations for people who have an IT background and who are sort of imaginative. 
uh, and who would like to work on some of these programs. I'll give an example of a good program. So Iran was moving ahead to make a nuclear device when suddenly their computers picked up this virus and it stopped them dead in the water. Not only did it stop them, but it pushed them back a year or two. How did that happen? It was a program by people involved in, in cyber war to stop them. So the, the ninjas or the, uh, uh, the behind the lines uh, workers, uh, there are not so many of this because we have drones. Uh, if you want to get into drone uh, warfare, but where the great opportunities are, I know for sure, this is August the 13th, 2012, is in IT and cyber war. And how do you do that? Uh, graduate uh, high school, uh, go to community college, then go to, don't pick up a lot of debt going to school, you don't have to. If you want to get a good job, go to community college for two years, then go to uh, a big university. I graduate from the big university, join the, the military, seek out jobs that have the cyber war, and then from there move on, and you've got a good, you've got a good career. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, giving the time, and uh, I mean... Uh, Nancy, I, I enjoyed it. Uh,